One of the great reasons to play 2nd edition Warhammer 40,000 is that this edition was the golden age for Space Marine Dreadnoughts. These are truly legendary Space Marines who were injured too badly to continue to fight on foot and have been sealed in an armoured tomb to maintain their bodies, then put in stasis and woken by the Tech Marines to assist their chapter in war. They hold a special place in the hearts of many, as most wargamers will eventually succumb to this fate themselves, sealed away in an assisted care facility after many years of suffering from crippling gout and woken up by a teenage orderly to ask if they need any more pork pies and scotch eggs. Canonically, dreadnoughts are the living relics of the Space Marine chapters who might be among the oldest humans in the universe. Some even go back as far as the time of the Primarchs. I mean the original time of the Primarchs, when they were tragic symbols of a lost great age of humanity. Not now, where they are popping up again all over the place, like the lost sixth act in Macbeth where he is resurrected to shill mobile games and VPN software. The mighty dreadnought was a great centerpiece model for your army, as well as being powerful and impressive on the battlefield. But how come? Well, in a sentence, it was shooty, tough and punchy at a time when many units weren't particularly good at one thing, let alone all three. This was the edition where the stock main weapons were very powerful to begin with and then given extra special abilities on top. For example, the assault cannon. This beast would hit on a roll of two or more, then roll three sustain fire dice, on average resulting in 4.5 hits. Usually every time an assault cannon fired it would have a 50% chance of jamming, but the Dreadnought's superior construction meant that you ignored the first jam rolled, so the odds dropped to around 7%. After you allocated fire to the opposing force, and with every hit after the first ignoring the usual targeting rules, your opponent would have to contend with strength 8 hits with a minus 3 save modifier that dealt d10 damage each. Monstrous creatures like Ogrins, Tyranids, Avatars and Greater Demons would have to respect this thing or risk being removed from the table in one hit. Meanwhile, an average armour penetration roll of 16 should punch through the armour of any light vehicle without too much problem. Ultimately, it would slaughter most things except units in Terminator armour and main battle tanks. However, if you did need to deal with those threats, this is where the second weapon option would come in, the Multi-Melter. No, wait, don't laugh. This wasn't the diet, low caffeine, low sugar multi-melter that you might be used to. This is the full, fat, illegal in most countries multi-melter that your mother warned you about. In second edition, the multi-melter was absolutely devastating. It would once again hit on a 2+, plus, and as it used a 2-inch blast marker, if you missed, it would scatter and possibly still catch something in value. If a blast marker covered a vehicle, it would hit the location under the central hole and every other location covered or partially covered on a 4+. Plus. Due to the scale of the models and the size of the template, this would usually be every single location on the vehicle. With an armour penetration roll of D6 plus 2D12 plus 8 and the hull of a main battle tank around 21 or 22, it would mean a 71 or 64% chance to penetrate. Plus, with the splash damage penetrating the tracks 91% of the time, it would have a decent chance of rolling on the damage table of whatever it fired at. Even the toughest armour value in the game, 25, a bunker or demolisher's turret, would be penetrated 42% of the time. It's not all good news, the avatar is immune, but almost everything else which failed a minus 4 modifier save would take 2d12 wounds and be almost certainly destroyed. It also had an alternate fire mode where it could be fired like a heavy flamer, which again in 2nd edition was terrifying as it had a special template that was around 10 inches long and anything under that would take a strength 5 hit with a minus 3 save modifier. Not content with that, surviving models would be set alight on a 4 or more and be unable to do anything but move randomly and take another hit each turn unless they rolled a 6, or you used models from that unit to try and put them out. For completion's sake, you could also swap one of these two devastating weapons out with a missile launcher, heavy plasma gun, twin-linked heavy bolter, twin-linked las cannon, and bafflingly, a single las cannon. But I can't work out why. To pile more icing on the already heavily iced cake, dreadnoughts have two arms, so in theory you could have two assault cannons or two multi-melters, if you held the forbidden knowledge of how to convert a metal model in the 90s, although the second weapon would likely be the stock missile launcher if you had that variation. But would a dreadnought survive? Well, the main body was armour 21, so a las cannon would only penetrate around 26% of the time. Most vehicles would be destroyed on a roll of 4 or more, but this being the edition where every single model had a unique damage table, dreadnoughts would only be instantly destroyed on a roll of 5 or 6 on their hull damage table. And even if it was destroyed, it only came to 145 points with an assault cannon, or 165 points with a multi-melter. And remember, this was an edition where 150 points would only get you 5 admittedly 
extremely overcosted space marines with no heavy weapons, or perhaps a single kitted out Imperial Guard squad. As a disclaimer to this, a marine army would need to take a 33 point tech marine before you could include any dreadnoughts or other vehicles, but it's still a bargain in comparison. Plus, those tech marines could be rammed to the gills with terrifying war gear. As a counterpoint, it would be very vulnerable to being immobilized, but with the powerful main weapons, that might be less critical than you would think. Of course, assuming it wasn't immobile, it was also pretty fast, like most dreadnoughts of this era having a movement value of 6 inches. It's nice to have, but running it forward is unlikely to make the best use of its abilities. In fact, the power fist is largely unnecessary, as the regular strength of the dreadnought is 7, and the power fist only takes it up to 8. Unlike the heavy weapons, the power fist gets no bonuses for being mounted on a massive 10 foot war machine, rather than being used by an elder guardian. However, if you were ahead of your time and stuck 2 power fists on a dreadnought, you would gain an extra attack and reduce the cost of one of these to only 115 points, which is crazy. In our next segment, I'll talk about the weaknesses. Ok, now that's over, we have to address the elephant in the room. You see, these days, some people would say that this is an easily exploitable example of broken game design, and they would be right. People would be selling 3D printed left arm assault cannons before the model had even been released. Well, what went wrong? Well, everything went wrong in every single way that it could possibly go wrong on one day in October 1998. That was the day that 3rd edition was released, and just so we feel old, that's a month after a little company called Google was founded. The third edition was a major rebalancing of the rules, and heavy weapons were hit hardest, specifically the assault cannon, which dropped down to strength 6 and couldn't easily penetrate power armour. Meanwhile, the multi-melter got it worse. It lost its blast marker completely, and only got one shot at 24 inches, which could only reliably penetrate armour at 12 inch range. The alternative option was the missile launcher, however it would be largely wasted against any infantry with a 2 plus save. It also dropped down to only hitting on a 3 plus, so much for being a mighty hero of the chapter. Meanwhile, while the changes in close combat meant that a large monster with a toughness value higher than 5 would only take one wound from the Dreadnought's power fist. Meanwhile, any penetrating hit dealt back to the Dreadnought would have a 50% chance of killing it outright. Overnight, it became a slow moving model that carried a twin linked LAS cannon as its main armament. Then, the new retooled Razorback was released with the same weapon that cost less and didn't take up an elite slot. If you wanted something a bit more sturdy with more guns, you could just go with a Predator Annihilator or or a land raider, or more likely, you would just arm your newly discounted five man tactical squads with single LAS cannons to fill out the mandatory detachment. The once feared dreadnought just couldn't keep up. Then the final nail in the coffin was bigger plastic tooling, which meant that Games Workshop could create bigger model kits like defilers, monoliths, and super heavy tanks, as well as different bigger dreadnought designs like the Redemptor and Leviathan and far more dangerous units like Sanguinary Guard or the god awful Space Marine Centurions. It's a sad end for one of the most iconic units in the game, 7 years of game breakingly awesome power followed by 25 years of irrelevance, like the career trajectory of a faded Britpop star. So what now? Well, Space Marine chapters will go to great lengths to maintain their living relics, and they will fight to recover the body of a dreadnought that has fallen in battle, and that's what I recommend you do. Find the fallen dreadnoughts on eBay, strip their layers of thickly applied paint, break apart the crusty superglue, and recreate their massive banners so that they may once again lead their chapters in battle. I'll leave you with this lament to a dreadnought. The dreadnought's armour, once gleaming and bright, now bears the scars of countless battles and fights. Its weapons, once feared by all who opposed, now broke down, worn and decomposed. The Dreadnought's pilot, once full of life, now trapped in his shell, eternally in strife. His memories, once vivid and near, now faded and dim, no longer clear. The Dreadnought's were the greatest of them all, a symbol of the Emperor's might, but in the last few years it's been a tragic sight. They fell out of relevance in an unsightly manner, but will be remembered forever by those who love Old Hammer. If you want to take a moment after that to sit down and compose yourself, I won't mind. However, if you want to watch another video, try this one about a classic battle report, and I'll see you next time.